I did uh, change some things on my notes, and I hope our guys got the changes, all right? I'll be reading from the screen, so um, let's like to go to Isaiah chapter number 59, and I want to read verse number 19. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. In the west, the people will respect the name of the Lord. And in the east, they will glorify him. For he will come like a raging flood tide, driven by the breath of the Lord. In the west, the people will respect the name of the Lord. In the east, they will glorify him, for he will come. Everybody say, he will come. He will come come like a raging flood tide driven by the breath of the Lord. I have one word that I'm going to use as a subject, and it's simply tsunami. Praise God. I hope that we have a holy tsunami hit this place today. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your power flow in this place. You said it was not by power, not by might, but by your spirit. Come down in this place in a holy and wonderful way today. Give us ears to hear what you would say to us. Give us strength and courage and faith to respond to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. Say it again, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. We're thrilled to have each of you here today, and I hope that something happens very good in your life before this service is over. You know what? There's nothing that can stop a flood. doesn't really matter what you do. They've tried to stop floods before, but there's absolutely nothing you can do when nature decides there's going to be a flood. How many of you ever had a house to flood? You, you've had that unpleasant experience. Wave your hand real high at me. You know what? Were you there when it happened? How many of you were there when it happened? You saw it. Wow. Is, there, is that helpless or what? I mean, I, I, uh, when, when my daughter was very young, uh, maybe about four years old, uh, the bio, they had just finished the, the uh, Hardy Toll Road, and, and uh, we, were, we were downstream from it. All that water off that concrete had to go somewhere, and it overflowed Green's Bio, where we, where we were living just two houses from it. And <clears throat> the water came up. One week it came up to our doorstep, and I just got out there, you know, being the man of faith that I am, and I just said, in the name of Jesus, stop this water right here, you know, and you know what? It stopped. Wow. I thought, man, this is great. It's awesome, man. I've been watching it rise, and it got, I'm telling you, it was at the doorstep, and it went down. Well, about a week later, it started raining again. The bio got out of banks, and here it comes, and so I'm thinking, hey, let me step out there on the porch again, you know. And so I just, uh, I just started praying, and and it just kept raining, and and I kept praying, and and before long, uh, it got up to that doorstep again. I said, in the name of Jesus, stop right there. And boy, it just kept on raining, and. Uh, in just a little bit, we found out there were some low points in the slab because under the walls, it started seeping in. Shalane was about that high. She started running around the house. It's coming in. It's coming in. It's coming in. (laughs) 
It wasn't very happy for me. But it was a helpless feeling. Hurriedly, I ran through the house, putting things as high as possible, things that would be ruined. And there's just nothing you can do. You just have to let it come. The Bible said the Lord is going to come like a raging flood tide. There's not a devil that can stop it when God gets ready to do it. A few years ago, we saw the news reports of the tsunamis that happened on the other side of the planet. Thankfully, we have not had that experience on the Gulf Coast. We have not had that experience on the East Coast or the West Coast where the tsunamis could be so devastating to the low-lying areas. But I have watched videos of it when it started coming in, uh, you, you know, into uh, cities and places where beach communities and hotel districts, and man, it just started coming, and it moved everything in its path, and it just started just flooding in. And it was, uh, it's a phenomena that is so, so uh, awesome in power that uh, nobody's ever been able to figure out a way to keep, they're studying the dynamics of waves and the physics of the situation as it happens, but they've, scientists have not been able to figure out how to stop such a powerful force. And so in Japan, we know the stories, and we've seen the videos and the video clips, news clips of, of, uh, of the devastation that happened, the nuclear plant that was overflowed with the tsunami and, uh, and how that there was a, a nuclear reaction there that contaminated a whole area and many thousands of people were contaminated with radiation. It's a, it's a, uh, that was so devastating that the effects of the radiation have been, uh, have been detected on the west coast of our own country. Now listen, I just want to tell you that uh, the, the Bible tells us that the Lord can come like a raging flood tide. And it comes with the breath of the Lord. You know, when it mentioned the breath, it started making me think about those scriptures that refer to the Holy Ghost as the breath of God. It makes me think about that time when Ezekiel looked out over that valley of, of dead bodies that had been constituted. And he said, oh, wind, come and breathe on these and give them life. And the Bible said that there was some breath from God that came. I just want to tell you that when God decides to do something in somebody's life, there is no force in the world that can keep it back. When God gets ready to move in on you, I just want to tell you if you're willing to let him do it, there's no force in hell that can stop it. There's no power of addiction that can keep it from happening. There's no sin too dark and too big that can keep him from working. He will do the work. Oh, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in this place today. Wow. Let's go back. Let's get a little background on this scripture. Man, this whole chapter is just so powerful. I could preach for days on it. Let's start today. You want to? You want to just go ahead and have preaching all day and... You know, right down the street here, they've got $5 pizza. We could probably eat pretty cheap. Eat a little while, rest, come back in for a little more preaching. Hallelujah. Who knows? You know what? This Isaiah 59 is so rich in prophetic overtones that fit with us today. I just had to... I, I, I want to I go through it. Isaiah 59 and 1. 
Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Let me just say, God's arm is not short. He hears prayer. You say, well, does he hear my prayer? He will hear your prayer. You know, there's a, always a controversy over, does God hear sinners when they pray? We're here, aren't we? Huh? Come on. You think you were born a saint? No. You prayed, and he heard you. His ear is not dull. He's not hard of hearing. I, I find myself, as age creeps up on me, finding uh, myself saying, pardon me. You know, of course, I've, I, I have that little speaker in my face, and I'm going to tell you, you might can just barely hear my playing out here, but I am rocking out over here with my guitar. I have my own private speaker, and I have it cranking right in my face. I'm over there just, uh, you know, that's, that's the way I'd like to do, but I can't. I got down praying for somebody Wednesday night, and I didn't think I was going to get up. Brother Thomas Brown had to help me up. But you know what? Listen, I just want to tell you something. His ear is not dull like ours. He's old. He's older than time. He's, he's old, but he's not old because he has no beginning, so he has no birthday. Come on now. You ever thought about that? God has no, has no birthday because there was never a time in the history of everything that he was not because he was there. He was there, and he will be there at the end. He has no beginning. He has no ending. So he can say from our vantage point that he is the Alpha and he is the Omega. So he's not old. His arm is not weak. He hasn't gotten weakened in his age because he's just as strong as he ever was. His hearing is just as good as it's ever been. I want to tell you that he can hear your prayer. He can touch your problem. He can reach into your life. He can do something in your life. Let me just tell you, God is God. He always has been God, and he's still God today. The Bible said Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, well, now, what's the problem then, Brother Foss? What's the problem in my life? Let's go to verse 2. But, everybody say but. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that... So, <clears throat> there's... Here we go. I'm trying to avoid this controversy of does God hear sinners? I don't think he's interested in helping you with your flat tire or your headache or your physical problem as long as you're not living right. Because in James 5, it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, I think God can show us that he's hearing us. But the end is that he wants you to face the sin problem in your life. That's the whole issue. You know, we say, well, I'm just going to come and get some blessings. I'm not, I really don't want to change my life, but I'd really like to ask God for some things here, you know. Well, there's something that's a barrier between you. There's some problems. 
Verse 2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins are a barrier. You know, in one passage of Scripture, he said, When I would have stretched out my hand to heal Ephraim, his iniquity was discovered. So there was, he was ready to do the work. He was ready to hear that prayer. He was ready to grant a blessing, but there was a sin problem. Verse 3, he says, he says in verse 3, your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wicked things. You know what? I see, I see, you know what I thought of? You know what I thought of is this society. The big issue of our society today is abortion. I believe we're in a blood-stained society. I don't think we're doing right about that. Our state tried to change it. A judge put it off. You can, well, I don't know what your opinion of it is, but I think they're playing God. You say, well, you know, it's a woman's body. Well, then it's a baby's body you're throwing away. I don't, thank you, sir. You know, I'm not trying to get off into issues here. I'm walking a tightrope, I know. And I know I've jumped off in the deep end without floaties. I think I can swim out of this. Let's move on. You know what? We're in a world that's just got the guilt of sin all over it. God's not so interested in hearing our prayers except there's one prayer that he's going to listen to, and I think we'll find it in the Scripture. Let's move on. Verse 4, he says, No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments, speak lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. That's our society today. That's sometimes our lives. Verse 5, we go, he says, They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin the spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die, and when one is broken, an adder is hatched. In other words, these eggs have little snakes in them, little devils, and they come out, and and it just uh, is going to be a calamity. Verse 6, he goes on. He says, their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and their acts of violence are in their hands. Verse 7. And their feet rush into sin, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts, and ruin and destruction mark their way. We are in a world that is headed for destruction. Let's go to verse 8. He says, the way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their path. They have turned them into crooked roads, and no one walks in them. Will, no one who walks in them will know peace. I think this is so true for people who are living their lives away from God. Verse nine. Verse nine says, "So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. And we look for light, but it's just dark. For brightness, but we walk in deep." Shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. At midday, we stumble as if we were twilight among the strong. We are like the dead. We growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice but find none. For deliverance is far away. Kind of seems like a hopeless situation. Our offenses are many in your sight, O God, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities. Now here we're getting close to something God's going to start listening to. Because when a sinner realizes he's a sinner, then that's something that God can deal with. When you realize you're walking in sin, when you realize that you're in the dark, when you realize that you need light, when you realize you need change in your life, now, now we're getting somewhere. 
rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, fomenting oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance and truth has stumbled in the streets and honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found and whoever shuns evil becomes prey. God looked and he was displeased that there was no justice. He saw there was no one. He was appalled. This is the plight of man. Boy, I see so much stuff here. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So, what? What did he do? So his own arm worked salvation for him. What did he do, Brother Gilstrap? He came to earth on his own. And he was the one that became the person that could stand in the gap for us. I preached last Sunday that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Oh, praise God. His own righteousness sustained him. He looked for a righteous one, but there wasn't one. He looked for an intercessor, but there was not one. He looked for a man to go, but there wasn't. And so he overshadowed a virgin, and he came to the earth as a savior of mankind. His name was Jesus because the... The scripture said he came to save his people from their sins. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Here's what he did. Here's what he did in verse 18. He put on a righteous breastplate and he put on the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and he wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Oh, oh, according as they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his people. Foes. He will repay the islands their due. And then it said from the west, men will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory because he's going to come like a pent-up flood. And with the breath of the Lord that drives it along, it's a tsunami. He's coming. He's coming to set it right. He's coming to take vengeance upon the enemy of your soul. But what's going to bring this Redeemer? What's going to bring this one that has the helmet of salvation and the blessed prate of righteousness? What's going to be the one that's going to bring the sword of vengeance? I'll tell you, the Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob. What's going to unleash the flood? Those those who repent of their sins. Oh, I know it's just old-fashioned preaching. I'm just telling you. This is not some modern concoction that we've come up with here, how to serve the Lord in two easy steps. I'll just tell you what we've done here is we just go into the Word and we find that He said the Redeemer's going to come. That flood, that pent up flood, that tsunami of the Spirit, that powerful moving force that's going to come, that's going to wash away all the junk and all the debris and all the dead limbs and all the junk that gets in our life, let me just tell you, that tsunami is unleashed when a person decides, I'm going to bow my knee and I'm going to repent of my sins. Lord, I've been a sinner. I need to make a change. Let me tell you, that's the flood that's going to come. It's driven by the breath of God and it's coming upon us.
As for me, this is my covenant with them. My spirit. Come on now. Come on, you're going to have to help me finish this. Y'all got me out in this. I don't have floaties. I'm trying to swim out. Okay, just help me out here. Come on. My spirit who is on you and my words have a, come on now. He puts his words. When the spirit comes, it's not me talking, but it's him. The Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let me tell you what, the Lord will put new words in your mouth. He'll put His Spirit in your life. He'll wash all the junk out of your life with the wave of His Spirit and He'll change your life. Everybody say arise. Arise, shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 2C, darkness covers the earth. Thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you. Who's he rising on? On the people that repent. On the people that have given their lives to the Lord. He said, I'll rise on you and the glory is going to appear over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. A tsunami is about to hit somebody's life. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's coming. It's coming. They say there's a backdraft. It starts happening. The water starts going backwards. A big change is about to happen. Something's happened. All the people standing on the beach, all of a sudden, the, the water starts going backwards, and they go, oh, wow. Tsunami! And they start running. Because out there is coming a big wave. It's going to hit cars, trucks, tanks, houses, buildings, debris, dumpsters. Garbage, dead trees, live trees, anything. It's just coming. Nobody can stop it. They can't do anything to keep it from happening because once it starts, that force starts. Listen, mama may try to get you out of the church. Daddy may try to keep you from getting the Holy Ghost. Oh, I want to tell you, brother may not like it. Spouse may not like it. But I want to tell you, they're going to get washed away because there's a life-changing event that will happen to you the moment that you bow a knee before God and say, I repent of my sins. I repent of my sins. And it starts happening. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit. Oh, let it happen today. Open the floodgates. 
I got on I got on Google Earth. I started trying to look at my at my dad's place that's up between Montgomery and Magnolia. I saw things. I saw it from the satellite view. I'd never seen it. Boy, doesn't 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 it look different when you're down here with your feet on the ground? I got to looking at it, Brother Gilstrap. And over across Jackson Road, there's a lake. I was surprised at how big this lake was, but I, I knew it had to be pretty good size. Because about six or seven years ago, maybe ten, I don't know, big rain came. And the dam that was holding this lake that was upstream from my dad's property broke. Now, at this particular place, this little stream, the railroad track is built up probably 15 or more feet. At least 10 feet. I don't, I don't, I'm just guessing. This is just pure granite rock that they put under a railroad track. And they have this little culvert that goes through the railroad track that since the stream is dammed up, well, you know, the, the release is kind of controlled what's going to come down. But one day that dam broke. And when it did, it came and blasted out that whole levee that the railroad track was built on. The force of that, it was the funny looking his thing. There was there was gravel and sand for a hundred yards or more that pushed into my dad's property. But the funny thing is that the railroad track and the cross ties stayed. And so here you have the railroad track coming and then there's nothing but just a railroad track with nothing under it with cross ties. And it goes over about 30 feet and 40, and then it comes back. I got to thinking about the power of just that little lake and how it rearranged the landscape. It took them several months to clean that up, and... I don't know if the people that owned the lake were responsible with the railroad, but it cost the railroad probably hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix that little problem. The reason I'm saying this is if a little lake can do that, what could a tsunami, what could a pent-up flood from the Lord what if he opened the raging floodgates of heaven on your life? You say, well, I'm on meth. I can't, I can't give it up. You know what? That's no problem for a tsunami. I'm an alcoholic. I can't give it up. No problem for a tsunami. I got a problem with this or that. I can't get over it. Let me just tell you something. The instant you bow your knee, the power of heaven. Come on. We talked about God a while ago. He's not old. He's not young. He's just God. 
He's the same God that looked out into nothing and said, let there be light and the sun just happened. Come on now. The earth was without form. It was void. It was just a blob of nothing just out in the middle of the dark. And he said, let it take form. He formed the mountains at his word. He formed the seas. He said, the night needs light. Because I'm going to spin the world with my finger. And it's going to spin for eternity until I say that time will be no more. It'll go around every 24 hours. It'll go around. And when it goes around, the backside of it's going to need a light. And so I'm just going to fling a little dust out into the cosmos and a galaxy Another galaxy, millions of galaxies, and there they are, just glittering and shining. And he took the moon and he flung it into space. And you're trying to tell me that that God, that God that could do that in less than a day's time, that God can't take care of your problem. Oh, let me just tell you, You need to repent of your sins and let that holy tsunami rush over you. Oh, oh, I remember when it happened to me. I went to the water and they said in the name of Jesus Christ, I now baptize you for the remission of your sins. When I came out of the water, my life was changed. It was rearranged. It was washed away. Go back to verse 1. You say, I need to be saved. He can reach you. Why? Because his arm is not short. Say, but I don't think he'll hear me. You try it. He's just waiting. He said, I'll open the floodgate. In your life. Come on now. I believe there's somebody that needs to do that in this service today. Let's stand. You have the choice. You can sit in darkness. Or you can pray. A simple prayer of repentance. Change your life. And let him rearrange it for you. I believe there are people that need to step out right now. You, You know this is for you. And you, and you need to, to make a change. They're coming. You ought to join them. Let the holy tsunami hit you. Come on now. Sweep over. Sweep over. Come on. I need permanent change in my life. Come on, we got a lot of people that's here that need God. You might as well join them. Don't think you're the Lone Ranger. You're not out there by yourself. There's a lot of people that need a change in their life. Come on, step out. They're going to sing this song one time, then the church is coming. Oh, hallelujah.
Jesus. Let it rain, oh Lord.